All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. I got the inspiration for this talk from uh, Buzz Lightyear from Toy, Toy Story. Remember the famous catchphrase? To infinity and beyond. So today I'm going to talk about uh, how you scale your application uh, with Cassandra. I'm a principal engineer from Intuit Persistent Service. Intuit is home for TurboTax, Credit Karma, QuickBooks, and MailChimp. Intuit Persistent Service, IPS, we provide persistent as a service that's used by many products at Intuit. We offer two flavors of product. We have what we call Team Manage and IPS Manage. Uh, team Manage is basically, we just give you uh, the code to deploy your infra, while IPS Manage is where we manage everything. So this is a flavor of our products. For example, Cassandra, we support both flavors. AWS Open Search, we only support IPS Manage. For Postgres SQL, we support both flavors. But for MySQL, we only support Team Manage. So what's, what is our value proposition for IPS? You see that I'm referring, uh, when I talk about customers, these are service developers at Intuit. If the service developer do deploy the database themselves, you see the activity that's in the dark blue circle that they are responsible for. Of course, they develop the business logic, data modeling, application integration, data lake integration, data governance like CCPA, GDPR, data lifecycle, like deleting your old entities, something like TTL. Data security is like you know, encrypting, encrypting your sensitive data at rest. Of course, there is alerting and monitoring, scaling, HA redundancy, and um, multimodal query patterns. Here, what it's referring to is you duplicate your data in multiple databases, the same data, but for different access patterns. I'll get to more deeply. And for team manage, when you deploy infra as a code, you see the light blue uh, circle there. Basically, these are the activity the client we provide either libraries or services and Intuit that the service developer can integrate with. So for example, you know, scaling, HA, and resiliency, they are, all you need to do is just you know, configure, but you do, we provide the hook for you to uh, enable it. For monitoring, for example, we provide basic you know, dashboard. That's important because a lot of people don't even know what to monitor for databases. So we provide a basic dashboard, but we are not responsible for the alerting. You know, they are responsible for their own on-call. Now you see, where IPS manage, where the value proposition really is the uh, biggest, is that really now you, as a service developer, you don't even care what data you persisted or how you manage your database, right? We are responsible for all the alerting, on call, your scaling, basically everything persistent as a service. All you're really calling us is via REST API. You don't even, you know, deal with the data, mo you know, uh, the data model that I'll get into. So today talks, we'll do a deep dive into IPS NoSQL. This is a product within Intuit that's over 10 plus years. It's a very mature product that's serving many critical use cases and used by multiple business units at Intuit. Today we have 10 production Cassandra clusters. All the clusters are active-active in two regions in AWS. Our largest production cluster is, is 117 nodes per region, and that could support up to 220K TPS of crude plus lease API. Our system are multi-tenancy. Multi uh, usually we stand up a cluster per business unit. Some bigger business unit has multiple namespaces or clusters. 
Our API is relatively very simple. We have, you know, crude bus list. For example, for list entity API, we only have two flavors. We have list by owner, list by index. I'll get into details later. And we have create, update, delete of entity and relationship. And we have both flavors of the API, single and bulk. To read entity, we have two flavors of API. For most part, most of uh, uh, services is just reading the latest version of the uh, entity. And for those who need like a multiple version to go through the historical version of the entity, we have that API. And for list relationship, this is where you want to find for a given entity, you want to find all the related entities. This is our overall uh, architecture. You see that the crude, our AP, REST API is fronted by API Gateway, where we have the crude bus list API. And everything in IPS NoSQL basically is, is in terms of uh, entity and relationship. So for entity, we have two parts of the data. We have attributes and we have uh, payload. There's a very simple reason for that. The attributes are stored in Cassandra, where the payload can be pretty large. So that, for that, we store in S3. For relationship, you know, this only has the Cassandra part. That, that way we store. And for every create, update, and delete of entity or relationship, a CDC event is generated. And that goes to our staging topic. This is our internal topic. And then we have an IPS domain event processor. This event processor, basically what it does is to transform, you know, what you have your raw CDC may not be the most useful for, you know, business analysts to understand. So we provide this functionality that you can do, you know, transformation from your raw CDC events to something that's more user-friendly uh, to be used. And this, what they call business events, are then uh, forward to domain topic. From the domain topic then, the same events is then is being consumed by another product by IPS. In this case, I give the example IPS search. So you can see this provides a very powerful system. What NoSQL is really good at is scaling and uh, high availability. But your ability to do ad hoc query is very limited. It's like, well, I want to do a most flexible query. I say, sorry, you cannot do that. <laughs> so what we provide is a very, you know, with just a few clicks in our UI and the configuration, you know, mapping between the, I'll go a little bit more in detail, is between the logical schema and the search schema. Now that you have, integration with IPS search and IPS search is backed by open search. Then you can do, you know, group by, count by, you know, a lot more flexible query that's allowed. So the same events that's consumed by IPS search then can be consumed by stream utilizer here to populate the tables in the data lake. This is where, you know, everyone now these days have uh, data lakes where you, the business analysts do their reporting and stuff. This is an example of the logical schema that this is the first thing our clients that interact with our system comes to define their data model. Here you see the type name here is equivalent to a table name. And you see in this particular entity, student has two attributes. You have first name and last name. And you see the type here also. And you see the data classification. This is the part that controls the encryption of data address. And the next thing you see here is the index definition. You see here the index here has, is a composite index of two attributes, first name and last name. And you have an option to define whether the index is unique. 
if unique is true, we'll do, we we'll check for a duplicate when you create a new entity. Our index are binary index. It means that we only support exact match. And it's a sparse index, so that if there's no attribute, no index will be created. So this is an example of an entity schema that we implemented. So there are many, many logical schema that user define. But underneath, we only use one table to persist all the entity. So you see here the partition key here is NS and entity key. NS is just a short for namespace so that each cluster or namespace in our cluster has a unique uh, namespace. Entity key is just a UID. Here you see the entity version. Uh, you see the ordering here is important. This is in decreasing order because our, most of our read pattern is reading the latest version of the entity. And then you see the attribute name value. This is just a, you know, any entity I can store any arbitrary uh, key value pair. And in this example, you see that there are two updates. Our entity version, by the way, is a UTC timestamp. So you see the first update, you have the first name, you know, is Denson. And then during the second update here, you see that a uh, last name is added. This is our index schema. This is the binary index that I'm talk I was talking about. This is to support the list by index call. Oops. In this case, you see, the, where is this so jumpy? In this case, you see that in this uh, partition key, you see the uh, index entity type, the index name, and index value. The important part here is the index value. This is, you see that since this is a composite index, you see that the you know, key and value for that particular composite index. And this one has to be a sorted map because you want to, this is an exact match comparison so that when you want to construct the partition key, it has to be always in the same order. So you cannot, uh, your map cannot be random. So for example, you cannot have last name first and first name switch, then you, know, it's not that, you cannot do an exact match. So in our list by index, so the first thing it does is a two-step process. So first you create the partition key in this case, right? And then you find all the entity keys. So the first lookup is to get all the entity keys that's mapped to this particular index. And then the second part is to fetch, you know, the entities in the entity table given the entity key. And this is our relationship uh, logical schema. You have a relationship type here. And then you define the from entity type. In this case, it's a student. To entity type, in this case, is a course. And the, you define the cardinality. It's basic cardinality for relationship. You have one to one, one to many, or you can have many to many. And this is the schema to support the list relationship API. You see here the uh, partition key here is from an S, from key. This is basically when you come and list for the API, you provide the from key and you provide the relationship type. And you see the relationship type and two entity type and two key as the clustering key right here. So in the list relationship call, you provide the from key, you provide the relationship type, and then I can look up all the uh, related entity keys and that's what being returned. And then the client usually then we call a uh, bug get with the entity keys to get if they want to get the details of all the entities. And one thing to note here, uh, our relationship are bi-directional. So you will see that this is what the direction type is for. 
So when I create the relationship in this case uh, from student to course, what I call here is the forward relationship. It's the way the user created it, and that's why the direction type is one. But we also created the reverse relationship. Basically, now, instead of student to course, it's the other way around. It's from course to student. The reason we do this is then you can, you can look up from either side of the, uh, of the node, right? So you can look it up from the from side, you can look up from the to side, and you can look up either way. I always return you a consistent representation from student to course. And something that is also unique about IPS is we implement an internal owner relationship. So every entity you created in IPS is owned. Uh, let's, for example, like user ID. So it helps with the security, right? Because if I own, if a user like me own a set of data, another user own different sets of data, then the data is secure at the, even at the persistent layer, so that another user cannot another access another user data, even if the service developer made a mistake. And having you know, clear ownership in this case really helps with the authorization and also securing the data. And we also have use case where to authorize more complex authorization scheme that we have to integrate with Intuit uh, identity system and the ownership information here becoming is useful for that. And this particular uh, data is also used to support our list by owner API. So a user can come in and list for, like if, I'm, if you're filing for your TurboTax return, I can see, give me my TurboTax return for this year, for example. These are some of the modern best practices I've learned is don't store a large blob of text in Cassandra. It's very expensive. You think about it, you know, our replication factor is three times in two regions times six. If you have a large blob and you can't even search on it, it's really expensive to store it in Cassandra. So for this case, we actually, that's why our entity has an S3 payload and that's why we dump uh, the payload to S3. Uh, one thing I noticed, people like to use a kitchen sink pattern so for example, if our entity schema has no logical schema, I'll put that as a kitchen sink pattern. You, know? you put arbitrary key value pair and no one will know what's in your entity table. Right? So you want uh, to make sure that you avoid doing that. Another thing I noticed, there are a lot of blocks written that for different access pattern, you duplicate your data. That, it's very expensive. You can do that, but it's very, very expensive. In our case, like our index scheme, even though it's very simple, it's just a binary index, but it provides an alternative access pattern to the data. But in our case, it's normalized. It's not duplicating the data, right? Duplicating data, you can do it, but to us, it's, it's super expensive. Of course, you pay in extra read. Now, instead of doing one read, you're doing two reads. But literally, the latency is tolerable, right? You're talking about a few milliseconds here. And this is from the experience you are doing NoSQL for the first time. It's almost guaranteed we do it wrong, myself included. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's something that you learn, you know. This is, this is our Cassandra setup uh, in AWS. We have two volumes. You have commit log. Uh, we have data volume that's four times one terabyte in GP2. Uh, there's a reason that we max out at one terabyte. In AWS, EBS volume, they give you the max IOPS and throughput at one terabyte. If you provision anything more than one terabyte, you're just wasting your money. Uh, not really worth it. So just don't do it. Uh, because we use EBS volume, so our compute and uh, storage are decoupled. We like it that way, keep our costs uh, 
you can control your cost better and also helps with the uh, auto recovery. We implement a self heal mechanism in our infra. When a Cassandra node goes down, it will go down and it will automatically restart it. So if a server goes down, a new instance will come up. We assign it the same IP and then we reattach re the volume and then just restart Cassandra and eventually within half an hour, the node will come up and rejoin the cluster, right? We don't even have to do anything about it. And our deployment uh, split evenly across three AZs in AWS. This is also uh, reflecting our replication factor of three. So we can tolerate like one complete AZ failure in AWS without affecting anything. And this is the time when I give a plug for our open source project. All these things that I'm talking about is in our open source project called DSC Pronto. Many years ago, well, many, probably four or five years ago, we had a big effort moving from uh, Intuit Data Center to AWS. And before, for our tax use case, we were provisioning, provisioning uh, for each tax year, we provision a new cluster. And that gets expensive pretty quickly. So as a part of moving to AWS, we consolidate this multi-year Cassandra cluster into one AWS cluster. As we migrate more and more data into this new cluster, we start seeing Cassandra ZC pods. They're like, this is the kind of stuff you don't want to see in Cassandra. <laughs> uh, so we went through like, you know, head deep down to optimize uh, uh, Cassandra to take care of this GC pods issue. So this is a process that we went through. Uh, here you, I gave up the samples of the settings that we did, that we tested, and then you know, take it to production. So we started with a kernel, and we tested each setting or a group of settings to make sure that we tested and verified the settings that we are putting helps with the, you know, helps with the issue, not make it worse. So, and the DSE has a very good uh, uh, article on the reference on this one. Uh, and next thing after we optimize the kernel, same thing again, we repeat the whole process again, you know, testing in each case to make sure that it actually improved performance. You know, then we move to JVM from JVM and then we move to Cassandra uh, you know, to optimize at each level. If you try to test everything all at the same time, a lot of times you cannot tell if helps or not helping, right? That's why we have a very methodical in our testing to make sure whatever we put in prod is actually tested and help. And the last thing we did was the uh, data stacks driver optimization. One of the things we enable is a speculative retry. This is uh, to minimize the, any service interruption that can happen. This is pretty standard if you are familiar with the data stacks driver. Uh, one thing that to call out here, uh, we do, for example, set the remote region connection to zero because we don't want to do and have any accidental uh, request to cross region. And one thing that we did, uh, this uh, no host available exception, this requires special handling for if there's a sudden network interruption, or sometimes I see it even with a few nodes with the GC pause, this could happen. So we have a special handling for that to make sure that our app server can recover quickly. It's basically we terminate all connection to the Cassandra servers and restart everything again. And that seems to you know, make our app server self-heal. Keeping Cassandra healthy is complex task. It's not an easy thing to do. And this is, you know, our experience from running Cassandra is running repair from day one. Uh, whatever you do, just do it. Uh, it really will save you. Uh, you don't want to suddenly one day, you, you know, 
you have inconsistency, and you cannot even run repair. I've seen quite a few cases of those. And another thing to notice is like, you know your data model, right? In our case, for example, you know, entity, if the client do a, you know, a lot of updates, then you can see that a white partition can happen. But since we don't expect that many updates, so we lower our threshold in this case, like this uh, compression large partition warning. The default is 100 megabyte. That's already too big. So we lower it to one megabyte so that we can get early read on if something bad is happening to our clusters. The thing is, white partition, when it happens, is very, very hard to clean up. And it affects the performance of your cluster until you remove it. So the earlier you can get notified and earlier you address the problem, it will help with the cluster health. And since we have a logical model too, then during every PR merge, we also review the data model. Like for example, make sure that our clients don't create silly indices on like Boolean or enum. You know, that basically will just cause a white partition on your, on, on your uh, indices. And lastly, use any tools you have you know, uh, to help with your operation, like running repair. In our case, we use the uh, op center. No one did everything by themselves. Uh, I do have a very good team, uh, a NoSQL team, very talented engineers that make all this possible. And lastly, we are hiring. Thank you, everyone. Uh, any questions? Uh, welcome to chat. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, five years ago, I think that's the time when we moved to AWS. So that's where we make the huge leap. Uh, we pay off our tech debt because we had to do schema migration also. So that was when the, I think uh, we paid our tech debt and that's why also we see the, then we also comfortable in expanding our use case, you know, uh, not use case, expanding our client base, right? Because if you don't have the right schema, uh, right framework in place is very hard to scale out and once you scale out when you know now we have hundreds of services in Intuit using our platform uh, It's okay now because you know now we have a stable foundation that we build on Mm-hmm So we are not using Cassandra CDC. Uh, we use our internal. Cassandra CDC is like, eh. <laughs> we don't really like it. Uh, so we implement our own CDC, and uh, we kind of do a pretty uh, cool stuff with uh, our CDC. So we use Kafka for our eventing, but as a resiliency uh, to make sure that you know, for every create, update, and delete, right? We don't want to miss any events. So basically, we have two systems. Basically, we use uh, Kafka, and then as a backup, we use SQS as a buffer. So for most part, if Kafka is up and running, we'll use Kafka. That's our first choice. When Kafka is not available, we will post to SQS. So that we, are, you know, if any system is, one is down or the other, uh, we are not affected because uh, if something is down, uh, we did have outage on our managed Kafka within Intuit, uh, our SQS buffer uh, kind of saved us because it was down for like a few hours 
uh, everybody was crying. But having the resiliency we build in, it helps that you know we don't need to do anything when the Kafka is up and running again. Our buffer from SQS start flowing in. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, uh, Kafka is more like a post events. So if, for example, uh, if Kafka is not available, uh, you know, I post to SQS. So it's uh, independent. So the transaction is always take, taking priority. So for example, if both systems are down, unlikely, we have transaction logs that we go through, we can go through and replay. Uh, that would be the last result because that's for, uh, it's not automated. It's more like a manual task that we can run, but we do have that option. 